Okay, for our last session of the day, we have an awesome panel of platform luminaries uh, led by the amazing Courtney, and Courtney will then introduce everybody else. So take it away, Courtney. Woo! So thanks for sticking around. It's been a very long, productive, fantastic day filled with loads of information. Um, we've very much seen the birth of the first Platform Engineering Day, so congratulations to everybody who has put this on. This is fantastic. Um, we're going to be talking about how to navigate the path to platform engineering success. Everybody is doing this, but we're seeing the birth of a movement here today. Um, and so we're going to kind of talk about the different things that people need to do um, and consider and how they can actually get their platform adopted and be successful in doing this so that in the future we're not discussing whether platform engineering is dead, whether we're discussing how platform engineering has changed the way that we're practicing and morphing into a new thing. So without further ado, my name is Courtney Nickerson. I work for a company called Coop Shop, um, and I'm going to let my lovely panelists introduce themselves. William? Um, William Rizzo, Suze. Hello, folks. Uh, my name is Aparna Subramanian. I'm uh, Director of Production Engineering, and I work for Shopify. Hi, I'm Abby Bangzer, and I work for Sintasso, and I'm also a co-chair of the Platforms Working Group for the CNCF. Hello, I'm Mareti Panu, and I'm working for SAP. Fantastic. So, Obviously, you guys have been here all day. We've heard loads of different definitions of what platform engineering is, what platform is. Are these two things the same? Abby, why don't you kick us off with this one? What do you think? Well, I think platforms are clearly interfaces, uh, <laughs> if you're here in the morning. Uh, no, I think platform engineering is engineering. I think there was a fantastic quote earlier in the day, um, I think by Samantha, someone, about how um, and it, platform engineering is a software exercise. Yes, it relies on reliability and operations, but it's a software exercise to provide value to your business. And that's what we're seeing with the platform as a product conversations going on all day, uh, as well as the, the different implementations, which value um, kind of day two operations and fleet management and APIs and all these things that we've been doing for software for years. And William, I know you are very passionate about your definition and the one that you like, platform engineering. How do you like, what's your favorite definition of it? Um, my favorite definition, it's uh, an empathy-driven and socio-technical exercise where uh, the features and the, of the platform are not necessarily at the, at the core of the platform, where, but the interaction between the developers, the stakeholders, the users, the platform engineers, and the out ultimate out outcome of the platform is what is most important. So that's for me a platform. Anything to add? Uh, I would like to add that a platform can be as thin and lightweight as you want, or it can be as uh, complex and heavy as your use case demands it. And I'll also say that as a user of um, you know, public clouds, uh, GCP uh, uh, at Shopify. Our platform actually evolves and morphs as the uh, capabilities of CC GCP evolves. So um, yeah, I think it's a, a platform is a living, breathing thing. And continuing with that, Aparna, do you think everybody needs a platform? Oh, that's a great <laughs> question. Uh, <laughs> Um, I mean, it depends, again, on, on your use case and the scope and the complexity that you're trying to solve. If it's, uh, you know, two people and, uh, you know, what your, if your scaling plans aren't that big, you know, maybe you don't need a platform. Maybe your platform is a set of best practices uh, on how to use certain things. But if you want more repeatable control, if you want more simplified management, if you want uh, predictability, if you want to scale things, uh, if you want fewer sort of like, you know, run books and like last minute heroics, then I definitely think a platform is a good idea. And what are some of the cultural drivers? Because Areti, I know you service, what did you tell me, 30,000 developers? I cannot hear you. So you service 30,000 developers, something yes. like that, as a platform 
engineer and product owner. So what are some of the cultural reasons that people need to be considering when they're doing platform? Um, I think many of the teams already had some layer of a platform. I think it comes to the question whether we need to centralize that platform. Because one way or another, everything had something. And that's something you need first to evaluate what is the status quo, what everybody's using, and then try to decide what needs are covered by what teams already have. Because you, it's not one customer there. You have very diverse setups, and you need to find out what all of them, what are the partners that they are actually serving, and then try to come up with the best compromise, because the platform in the end is a compromise. You can't have one platform that serves every team. So you have to find the best minimum viable product. Absolutely. William, you work with a lot of customers, right, and consulting them. So how do you see the, the whole cultural aspect of, of platforms, and, and how do you help people with those situations? Um, that's, there, is no, uh, there is no cookie cutter solution for our situation that I'm in. Um, there are several customers which do not understand the benefit of platform engineering. Uh, other customers that do need to understand, want to understand the benefit of platform engineering, but they are um, scared because they can't, they can't calculate an ROI. I was speaking with Abby. Um, and there are some other customers which I always ask, what is, the, uh, what is your ultimate goal? What is the business value? Are you reaching your business value? Are you, is there impediment in reaching that business value? If the answer is yes to the last one, then okay, let's see how we can move forward. And what are are you working into silos across developers or um, operation folks? Can uh, is there already an initiative that is self um, self initiated by the developers normally to, uh, to build something to speed up the business value or to the, or the development? And and I approach it uh, as a consequence to those answers. Of course. I think it's a really interesting combination between what you said already and what you said, William, about uh, platforms versus platform engineering. Because the, the conversation you said here was already was that everybody has a platform. It's just to what degree they're investing in it, to how cu uh, customized it is across the organization and how standard it is. And you mentioned the conversation on uh, whether or not people believed in platform engineering, William. And, and I think that fits really well with this maturity model that Nikki just blew us out of the water with on the last talk, that we start at the provisional level, not to say that you are insufficient if you are at provisional, but to really call out the fact that I would argue every person in this organization, in this room and, and in any technology organization is using a provisional platform. You may not be investing in platform engineering as a practice and with like kind of concrete outcomes, but you're using a platform. When you need the more um, centralized and when you need to invest in the kind of built-in security and those kinds of things, that's when you need to invest in platform engineering as a practice, a socio-technical practice. And so I think that's an interesting conversation between platforms versus platform engineering. And Talking a little bit about getting buy-in from people, Aparna, you also work a lot with getting buy-in and have, helping platform teams advocate for themselves. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, I think of it as more of a partnership than buy-in, right? Because if you're really collaborating with your application development teams and you're helping them solve their problems, then the buy-in part becomes, uh, you know, less of a hurdle, you're actually co-collaborators and you're solving the problem. And I've also seen this pattern where the, the solution is actually created by the application development team. And then as a platform team, you work with them, you standardize them, you know, you maybe build, built in, build in security and other things, and then you sort of create a standardized solution for the rest of the company. So uh, yeah, that's how I... Uh, would approach it, and uh, we approach it at Shopify. Is it's like, what are you solving for the uh, application development team? What are you uh, solving for the company and for the business? Awesome. So there's a lot, and we've heard all day today how to put your client front and center, your user, who are they, and what things need to be considered. But you go through all that process, and the question begs if you build it, will they actually? come and when they do will they actually use it 
So who wants to take that one on first? I want all of you to speak to this because I think it is the, the question of the day. Yes, I think everybody needs to answer this because everybody has a very different perspective of if you, they build it. First of all, they need to know about it. So depending on um, how big your organization is, you have to find the right way, the right channels to advertise it. So just because you have a great platform doesn't mean that people know about it if it's not advertised the right way. Um, the other thing is that it needs to be interesting. It needs to solve a problem that they actually have. If everybody has something that is working and then you say, here's our new platform, nobody's going to come because it doesn't solve anything new. Um, and I think the third thing is, at the end, management support. If the platform is interesting and it does solve a problem, to allocate the time to move to the platform because that doesn't necessarily come free. And I think that blends very well with developer experience that the requirements come from developers. So if there are no requirements, no need for it, they won't come. Absolutely. Next, who are we going down the line? On? Uh, I'll go from maybe, I, I agree with everything you said, so I could just repeat it all, but I'll, I'll come from a different angle and say also whether or not they need to go to the platform. So I think we often try and deliver a platform and people will come because it's so interesting, but do they actually even have to realize they're using the platform? Can you build things in in a way that is kind of transparent to them? I learned this lesson the very hard way after per rolling out CICD templates to an organization of sort of 30 to 40 services. So sort of pretty small scale in comparison to a lot of the organizations here. And then we wanted to change how we delivered the software. So we wanted to change from a push-based kubectl apply kind of push to a GitOps pull. Well, that involved changing all of those pipelines. And all of those pipeline templates that had been so nicely rolled out had all changed, because now they were owned in the different code bases. And when we were like, but this is great. You have better disaster recovery, and it's more flexible, and you'll love GitOps, everyone's like, I don't care. <laughs> uh, and so what we realized is we needed to roll out not only um, to those pipelines ourselves manually and give this to them, but we also had to roll out in a way that gave us as a centralized team more ownership over improving those over time, because the teams didn't actually care. They just wanted their stuff in production. And so yeah, I think sometimes we worry so much about them about users wanting to come to our platform, we forget that our platform in some ways could be transparent to them, and that might be the best possible solution. Awesome. Yeah, I definitely agree that migration is probably the hardest aspect of uh, adding new features to a platform. Creating new platform features is actually the easy part. And how, how you engage with your internal customers, how you bring them along, how you make that process of like migration and onboarding to this new cool feature that you've built in the platform, that's the hard part. Um, I'll just say that uh, don't think of your platform users, even if they are within your same company, as like the captive audience, right? Because I mean, your, the, the feature has to justify its value, just like a product in the market, uh, for them to be able to like adopt it and appreciate the value and onboard to that new feature that we have built. Um, I was, I would say. If if, your quest, if you have built a platform and then your question is, now I have to get users to come on, I think you shouldn't have built the platform, the platform in first place. So the platform is a response to a need, to a, an agreement that you have with the developers or uh, the developers uh, that initiated this thing, building this thing. And the developer themselves or the platform team will get for, we will get more developers to onboard through a deve an internal developer relationship program or through just uh, uh, word of mouth. So the platform, it's, so the answer is, if the platform is already there, you, uh, they are not going to come. They're going to come if the platform is built in the process with them already. Yeah, I think that's a huge, huge thing that we need to talk about as well, is how do you include people to make sure that they're on that journey with you? So what are some steps that you've taken, Arati, for example, to include people to make sure that they're on that, on that journey with you as um, you build? I, I think um, there was a presentation before about UX mm -hmm. so, um, and product management. Uh, it's first to have um, interviews, conversations with end users, to try to see what they are actually doing, not what they say they are doing, but um, it was in the UX presentation. It's actually 
letting them go through a system or say, what are you doing today? And not what you think you're doing, but what you're actually clicking on today to get something done. And when you see what they're actually doing, when they get stuck, where is the friction, then you start having what is the need. And then you get to see the opportunities that might happen, which might be we just need to write some documentation here. We just need to improve the error message, and nobody needs a platform. Um, so it comes from the product problem. And facing it like this, then it becomes much easier to decide also what to build and whether you need to build. Um, so this is how we are actually doing it, or we try to do it, at least. Abby, anything to add? And I, it's terrible going after already. She says all the smart things. Uh, <laughs> no, I think. But you have nicer stories. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think uh, bringing people on the journey is, as you say, meeting them where they are. I think, again, I'll, I'll maybe be uh, uh, contrary to what some people think, but sometimes I think the interfaces we use should actually be the ones we currently use. So it's not. You know, everybody's like, oh, I want to get away from ticketing platforms. Oh, I want to create these brand new, amazing web portals or CLIs and things. But that's changing user behavior. And if you're not going to 10x, 100x the value to that user of what they're going to get from this brand new product that we already know we're not supposed to build completely before they, we bring it to them, because then they'll never come to it, then we're unlikely to meet that. And we've changed their behavior for not a ton of user benefit. So I think where I've seen some success is when we actually put automation or better experiences behind the interfaces we're already using. So they're starting to get value quickly. Uh, and then they're more inclined to change their behavior towards whatever new interfaces you want to introduce because they are, you've already won their, uh, won, won their interest, right? You've given them some value already. Yeah, I'd say that uh, as a platform team, you know, you probably already own a set of applications or services that you own and you run, you know, be it like an inventory management system, fleet management system, whatever. Use those to actually dog food the platform that you're building, right? And I think that goes a long way in uh, being able to experience those issues firsthand and, and gaining the trust of uh, the development teams. Anything to add, William? You want to jump in? I am I'm very sorry, I didn't understand the question. <laughs> <laughs> OK, we'll skip. New question for you. you what types start, of things should they you be? start there now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What types of things should they? So we're bringing the customer along with us. We're assuming that they're always right. But what types of things should we be measuring as we're looking to the adoption of people adopting our platform to ensure that we're on a path of, of success? Um, I love what the speakers before us said. Um, if you can't measure it, it didn't exist. So what should we be, what should, should we be measuring? Everything. Uh, what should we care about? What brings, us, what brings business value forward? What satisfies the, this business requirements? Uh, we, need to, we need to be able to measure productivity. We need to be able to measure satisfaction of the, of the, of the users. Uh, we need to have a constant feedback of the users. These are all measurements that might be numbers, might be uh, heat maps, or mm -hmm. however you want them. But we need to be able to measure from the users. Did we need to build a roadmap? Did we meet that roadmap? Did we meet that uh, deadline? And did we satisfy the, the requirement of the developer or the stakeholder of the platform? That's what I think. Aparna? Yeah, it's, it's definitely a combination of like, you know, measuring all of the SLOs, the KPIs, and also what Arati mentioned about like also doing like user interviews uh, because, you know, this is only like part of what you can measure and what you can understand. But there's also the other aspect of like the true partnership, working with the customer, your users, understanding their pain points. So I think they go hand in hand. I guess the only thing I'd say to that is measure everything so you can track it and change it, but also understand it's okay to have measurements be short-term uh, value. So Goodhart's law, what you measure will change behavior. Sometimes it makes sense to have a measurement for a period of time to track an improvement you want to introduce, but a long-term version of that measurement may actually swing the behavior in a negative way. And so I think, yeah. Think about tracking what you're trying to introduce without feeling like it has to then be something you measure on a dashboard for the rest of your, your career. <laughs> and 
when it, I think this is a very interesting question, and it's very, very hard to measure when somebody says, what are you measuring? I, I can't think, because it's, it's a very complicated thing in the sense that platforms, we, I'm product owner of the CI CD setup. So people are not coming back to set up pipelines daily. So it's not growth. <laughs> and they have set up one pipeline. They have not set up a second one. Is that because it was not good enough? or because they just had one service to build the pipeline on. So when it comes to measurement, you mostly have indicators. So you try to find two, three indicators that make sense and see how they're moving, especially in the beginning. Because growth in the sense, and it's also a finite market. You're not having the world, you have 20 development teams. So you have a very limited market, and it's not really growth in this case. So it's kind of looking into the indicators, seeing what makes sense, switch, and then see if it's word of mouth in the end and qualitative data, because referral is mostly what gets the platform going. Absolutely. And oh, just a side question. So as your platform matures and you kind of identify those indicators, do those indicators change over time? Do you need to change the, what, what it is that you're measuring? Or do you stick to the same measurements and indicators? How do, what does that maturity look like as time goes on? Um, I, th I think also you're doing it for the usage. How, many, how, how is your platform used? Um, but you need to combine it with um, it's not used because it's not easy. It's not used because it's not necessary. It's not used because, because, because. So I think the indicators with the questions change in combination. Um, I can't think of a good example now of how to do that, but I, I think it's balancing this too. Yeah. Okay, Aparna, add. Yeah, go ahead. No, I'll just uh, maybe give an example that um, maybe if you're use it, rolling out a new feature, measuring daily active users is, is great, right? Because this is the first week, and okay, you want to know how many teams are even like trying it out, but quickly that that doesn't become a very relevant metric uh, to use. And then it becomes like, OK, how many times this thing actually works? What's the deployment time? Are we improving the deployment time? Are we shortening it? Are we actually helping it to the productivity? So I think it, that's probably an example of a metric that would change over time. Anything else, William? I would say that um, because the numbers show what we want to see doesn't mean that it's a good thing. Um, so. Mm. What, uh, we said measure, measuring, uh, so because people are involved, I like, I like the, the term evaluating more than measuring. So when we are measuring, we're measuring active users, we're measuring very precise numbers. When we are evaluating, we are doing that, but we are also associating those, those numbers to the experience of the user. Is the developer sticking around because uh, it's, it's doing a lot of work, or is the developer sticking around because he can't get the work done, or she can get the work done, and it's trying, it's, it keeps trying to get it done. So we need to, so the number would be the same in both cases, but the evaluation would be diametrically opposite in, than in, in both cases. So we need to have a way to measure the, the numbers, but we need also to have a way to evaluate the experience and associate it to those numbers. No, I think you draw on a very important point, which is, is about the human interactions, the human relationships, and how people are actually relating to something as human beings, because it's their day-to-day -to -day tool, but they are day-to-day -day humans also. And so the words that we're using and how we're defining these are using evaluation instead of measurement for certain aspects, or promises instead as, as a way to get people involved in the process are, are super important things to keep in mind. Um, we're getting close to time to wrap up, so I think we should really take advantage of the fact that we have pros and ask for some pro tips. So give me your best pro tip for navigating this whole process to make sure that you find success. Who wants to go first? Aparna. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll say that as platform teams, it's often tempting to put 
yourself, which is the platform team uh, first, ahead of uh, the application team and ahead of the company. Uh, so I think it's just important to be mindful that you know the company or your business comes first, and then your customers, and then yourself. Um, as uh, difficult as it may be to like sort of have that identity value, what is my team doing? Sort of justification. Um, as platform teams, it's always uh, the best thing to put the company uh, in, ahead of ourselves. Abby. Uh, yeah, I think I'd add a, that it's important to realize that often we're in the position as platform engineers to keep the lights on. We're doing a lot of the BAE work around an organization and it's hard to do a rewrite of something as foundational as a platform. And so what we need to be looking for is ways to take the value we already have in our organization and make sure that we expose that in a more self-service way, in a more operationally kind of fleet managed way um, and and make sure that we're building in those business requirements to make that more manageable and maintainable for our business and more valuable for our business without feeling like we need to pull in whatever brand new tool has just come out and completely rewrite every piece of technology uh, in our organization. Are you William? Which one? William. William, go um, for it. I would say that the platform is nothing more than a, than a digital screwdriver. It's a tool. It's something, that, it has a mean to an end or a mean to multiple ends, but it's just there to satisfy a goal. So, and that's how it should be seen and used and eventually dismissed when it's, it's not relevant anymore and just move on to the next platform. So treat it, treat it more as that to satisfy the need of its users rather than to satisfy the ego of its creators. <laughs> Um, and I think because the, the people we build for are colleagues in the end. So it has to do with the relationship of trust. These are not random people that you will never see around, but these are people you're actually sitting in the same offices with. So when you have this, you, you have to have this relationship of trust with them so that they are using something within the company. And usually in the companies, people talk to each other. So having this relationship with the people you're building for, I think it's it's a good thing and platform teams are um, in a privileged position to work with their end users in the same office. Absolutely, awesome. Awesome insights. Um, just to wrap up a bit, I know all of you are involved in different types of groups, <coughs> excuse me, and create different resources, have different communities that you're involved in. We've got a list up here so that we can help everybody get involved, but talk a little bit about the different groups you're involved in. Um, Aparna, why don't you go first? Yeah, uh, we'd love for more end users to join the CNCF end user developer experience SIG. Uh, you know, in the CNCF parlance, end user means you're not selling or uh, monetizing. Uh, any of these cloud native technologies, but you're using it as a as a user. So um, we have uh, the developer experience SIG that meets uh, every other Thursday, and we'd love for more participants to join us and uh, discuss the topic of uh, all things uh, platform and operationalizing a platform. Abby? Yeah, I think you've heard today a bit about the CNCF platforms working group <laughs> underneath the uh, tag app delivery. So there's some fantastic work being done and there's a booth within the sponsor hall later uh, where there's going to be some fantastic conversations around how we do platform as a product in real life today. So again, if you're an end user, that's where uh, there's a lot of value to have those conversations and, and share your stories. So uh, yeah, please get involved and come find us in the CNCF Slack and elsewhere. And already you've shared so any, many resources. I'm not in any community, though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing nothing. But, but I, I saw now there is a um, platform as a product research group, mm -hmm. which I would like to be involved in. And I've put in there some books that everybody wants some very basic product management skills just to see what five things to do are. I've put there some resources that anybody can just live through and get an idea. William? Um, yes, I have recently joined the, the Tag App Delivery wor uh, Platformers Working Group. Um, I, am, uh, uh, I am also part of the Tag Environmental <laughs> Sustainability. Uh, and uh, please join us in either or the working group. Um, yes, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty much all. But that's great. 
because make... William does this all the time and he's just joined. So everyone can join. It doesn't matter how advanced of user you are or not, I, join in. I believe, um, I believe the least advanced or whatever advanced means you are, the more welcome you should be. Uh, a fresher look at things is always better. Uh, from very, very strong uh, leaders, they might, if they are really leaders, they are going to get suggestions for somebody that just came in and sees things from another perspective. So you don't need to be advanced in anything to join something. Absolutely. Something very concrete you can do this week is we're having morning coffees. I know it's 7.15 in the morning. I'm so sorry. But if you're awake, uh, Le Balloon, which is the, a hotel just across the street, is hosting. Uh, we have some uh, coffees being hosted in the mornings from Sintasso, my company, Gitpod, and Crumware. Uh, so some croissants and coffees with chats about platform engineering. So please come and meet the community, share your stories, and it's a great way to, to get to know people. You also do online coffee lunch sessions. Yeah, that's London. Yeah, coffee yeah. It doesn't ops, matter. London, doesn't come hang matter. out. It's online. UTC. It's uh, available to a lot of Europeans. Then, so yeah, ton, tons of places to get involved. So, thank you very much. I'm sure there are questions. So, any questions at all? We've probably got time for one or two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, just a quick sort of question here. Um, a lot of the responses of sort of why you do platform engineering were very end user sort of efficiency driven. Um, I usually think of like the ultimate constraint of platform engineering to tend to be your compliance. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So yes. can you talk a little more about that? Can, sorry, I feel very passionately that today <laughs> platform engineering is like uh, the attempt to be a cool office from like 15 years ago, where if you had beer in the fridge and a foosball table, everyone was like, this is the best work-life balance. We do. <laughs> we do. Okay. I'm not saying you can't have those things, but I feel like this talk about that the only reason we do platform engineering is for developer experience is very missing of the reason why it gets invested in by organizations. And when we look at that kind of cool office vibe and how we've actually transformed to realize that the best offices are the ones that provide work-life balance and autonomy and the way to do your job and, and feel pride in your job, not about the beer in the fridge, I think platform engineering needs to go through that evolution as well and and invest even more in the in the other side I, I would like to say that um, in my company the platform that we're building now is the old compliance tools coming together so in our case it's the other way around so we're never the cool people <laughs> <laughs> well, you have foosball we, we, so we still work for SAP yeah, great. yeah so but but we were the compliance people we had the several tools that didn't necessarily fit well together in an end-to-end -end process. And this is what we're trying to do now with the platform. So we were never the cool kids. We still had the football and beer. But I love it. And a good couch. <laughs> but not, not the cool people. <laughs> OK, I think we've got time for one more question. One more question. Abby, you've spoken about delivering more value in the back end to make them come. So what are some things that the platform can be 100% opinionated about in the back end that will somehow promote ROI or efficiency in any other way? That's a great question. So I think one place, and speaking to the, the point made of is this all about developer experience or some other compliance things, is around cost. Uh, so I think there's a lot of things you can be 100% uh, opinionated about in your, in your platform around how you size services, how you shut things down that are in development environments on the weekends, cube cost, and other uh, really great tools out there for the eco impact and money impact. And those are the things you also start to buy in uh, and get return on investment from uh, your finance department and other people wanting to support your platform because they're seeing a, uh, a reduction in cost. So I think those are one area you can do. And also when you come again to the end-to-end -end processes, what are the tools that the platform really supports? 
So if you have some um, exotic, let's say, new language, it doesn't necessarily mean that the platform supports it end-to-end. -end. The tools, yes, might uh, independently do so, but it's not really easy, maybe, end-to-end. -end. And that's where it's opinionated, saying these five languages are supported, this sixth one, eh, um, just pick and choose. Great. We're done. Fantastic. A big round of applause for our amazing panel.